Hey, this is Daniel Hutchins, and today we are talking about some articles from our friends Screen Rant. So today from Screen Rant, we are doing a double article discussion video. For the first part, we're just going to be talking about is the Suicide Squad proves Warner Brothers learned the wrong lessons from Batman vs. Superman. And then the next part I'll announce as the video goes later on. But okay, so Warner Brothers made massive changes to the DC Extended Universe plans after Batman vs. Superman. But, however, the Suicide Squad shows they learned all their wrong lessons. Now, this was hot off the truck an hour ago. So, it's quite new, guys. So anyway, so despite its positive reception and a high Rotten Tomatoes score... Suicide Squad is failing to meet expectations in the box office, proving that Warner Brothers' extreme reaction to Batman vs. Superman Donna Justice initially reception was misguided. Warner Brothers' plans for DC films has been all over the place due to their failure to learn the right lessons from Batman vs. Superman. Ron Tomato score and box office scores but put in the DC extended universe into an extended state of disarray okay so after Batman vs Superman landed it had a shockingly low score on Ron Tomatoes and saw a big drop off in its second weekend at the box office despite the record set in opening weekend Warner Brothers panicked. They delayed the start of Justice League's principal photography, which was set to shoot immediately after Batman vs. Superman, for, Vax, for Zack Snyder and Chris Terrio to rewrite their script, while also ordering last-minute rewrites and reshoots on David Ayer's Suicide Squad. To add to more humor, starting a chain reaction, the DC Extend Universe has been unable to recover from its Warner Brother continues to try to escape the shadow of the Snyder era. Okay, so related to this article is how Warner Brothers is continuing DC Snyder's verse without Zack Snyder's plan. But we're not talking about that, we're talking about something else. So now Five years later, the consequences of that failed strategy were only becoming more apparent. Warner Brothers executives at the time were envious of Marvel's flawless record from Ron Tomatoes and consistent box office hits. But not understanding that the MCU's consistently high review scores were only a symptom of their success. While the actual cause was Kevin Foggy's franchise building suave it would have really wanted to learn the white lessons from Batman vs Superman they should have looked to how Foggy was patient as he established the MCU's foundations and demonstrate confidence and his creatives and generated excitement for the larger MCU plan instead Warner Brothers is producing movies like Suicide Squad that generates positive reactions to the release, but fail to justify their own budgets or drive excitement to what's coming next. Focusing too much on Ron Tomatoes has sabotaged the DC Extended Universe. So instead of focusing on building their film universe, DC tried to emulate Marvel movies, reportedly chasing the Hubert style of Deadpool and Garner's Galaxy, with reshoots ordered for David Ayer Suicide Squad, but later by literally hiring this man, who directed the first two Avengers movies and shepherded the MCU through Phase 2, Joss Whedon, to turn Zack Snyder's principal photography into something more tonally in line with Whedon's MCU work. Now, okay guys, so every single one of these tactics failed at getting Warner Brothers what they really want, but Suicide Squad still got lambusted 
by critics, scoring an even lower Rotten Tomatoes score than Batman vs. Superman. And then Justice League scored yet another Rotten Tomatoes score on a tomato meter and was DC Extended Universe's lowest gross movie to date when it's the most expensive movie yet and should have been the franchise's crown achievement. Although bringing together DC's biggest heroes, Wonder Woman and Aquaman were well received. Very financial, successful, but both are ultimately products of the Snyder era Warner Brothers was trying to escape through. And our DC Extended Universe eventually put together a couple of back-to-back -back movies with high Rotten Tomato score, but the box office had all but disappeared compared to franchises' earlier installments like Shazam and Birds of Prey, or two DC Extended Universe's best-reviewed movies, but also represent the franchise's lowest gross movie so far other than Suicide Squad. In fact, while there's really no correlation between the DC Extended Universe Von Tomato scores and box office scores, every single movie directed or developed by Zack Snyder earned more at the box office than every single movie made since he left. But other than Zack Snyder's Justice League, which didn't get a theatrical release, it still has no official performance numbers from HBO Max, it's hard to know how Wonder Woman 1984 would have even been, considering that it received at the box office and it didn't land in the middle of the pandemic. But it may not have made a huge difference since the conversation that wraps around that movie is highlighted by its massive Rotten Tomato drop after the release. Wonder Woman 1984 may have been a boon for HBO Max, but other than that, there's not much to write home about, and it's been mostly forgotten less than a year ago. So, the Suicide's rave reviews didn't save it from the box office. So then came The Suicide Squad. While Hyman, former Marvel director, didn't work for Justice League, Whedon arguably didn't have as much to work with since he took over in the late production and wasn't able to craft the movie from the ground up. So Warner Brothers tried again with James Gunn. To be fair to Warner Brothers and Gunn, they got exactly what they want, but in a Suicide Squad movie, drawing huge praise from critics and beaten to a 100% Rotten Tomato score, before settling down to DC Extended Universe second highest score at 91%, just below Wonder Woman. Unfortunately, the Rotten Tomato score didn't translate box office success, like Wonder Woman 1984, but we'll never know what the Suicide Squad would have done financially if it weren't for this stupid-ass pandemic. Although, brushing the box office numbers aside, as an unavailable casualty of this damn coronavirus, would m miss some more other important factors namely the second weekend box office drop. Because nobody wants to go out to the damn movie theater anymore. So, related to this article is why The Suicide Squad is a box office disappointment. Now, I did a video about that, so please check that out on my channel. It's probably a couple rows down, but you can probably check that discussion on my channel as well, because I did discuss about that. Now, if you subscribers remember, you probably might have already seen it. But don't spoil it for no one who hasn't seen it, because they have to see it. But while Total Box Office never had much of a chance, which is why the film was simultaneously released on HBO Max, the drop-offs from opening weekend to the second weekend is proportional number. The Suicide Squad's second weekend drop wasn't just the highest drop from the history of DC Extended Universe, even higher than Batman v Superman's second weekend drop that the initial caused Warner Brothers to basically detonate their franchise plan, but also the highest second weekend drop from any post-pandemic blockbuster. Despite the high Rotten Tomato score, the Suicide Squad actually got a B-plus cinema score. 
as original Suicide Squad just above the B earned by Batman v Superman. But Cinema Score isn't the most scientific tool, as y'all probably know, but as it's just in person survey conducted randomly by Movie Open at Night. But it generally is accepted as an indicator of movies' perceptions by the general audiences, and therefore word of the mouth, which isn't always believed, by the way, which is the major factor in second weekend box office drops. Now, despite having the colors and the humor, and especially Ron Tomato score Warner Brothers was looking for this whole time along, it still underperformed. Even with the pandemic box office standards, it's hard to condemn that a movie's financial performance, with so many circumstances to play outside the lines with the filmmaker and studio's controls, but the only positive spin to put for the Suicide Squad performance is that it's doing well on HBO Max, which would, could be even more profitable than theaters. But it's still doubtful that Warner Brothers is thrilled with the Suicide Squad's box office number. Tone was never the DC Extend Universe's problem. Now, ever since the release of Batman v Superman, Warner Brothers has been pushing for a light-hearted movies and adding humor to the films. Seemingly, though, it to more closely match the tone of the MCU, as detractors have demanded for years. Now, Zack Snyder says that they were obsessed with making Justice League funnier. While nothing was inherently wrong with comedic tones, fans who were brought into the DC Extended Universe at that point were on board with a tone and story being told so far. So the drastic shift away from only alienated the franchise's biggest supports and supporters while failing to grow a new audience enthusiastic for this new direction. In fact, it turns out tone wasn't a problem for the franchise at all. Even with after Todd Phillips struggled to get Joker off the ground, with Warner Brothers infamously concerned about the ability to sell Joker pajamas, the fuck Joker pajamas, yep. So, Joker went on to become one of the highest gross in DC films yet, despite being one of the darkest. And the studio didn't even see any of the profit, after selling off a large share of the film to outside financiers. Related to this article is Joker proves Ron Tomatoes' bias toward mediocre movies. But we aren't talking about that, we're talking about something else. So now, years later, Zack Snyder's Justice League coming out represented Snyder's original version for Justice League, and it's even more confusing as to why the fuck Warner Brothers pulled the fire alarm and abandoned this direction. The movie is far lighter than Batman v Superman, and there's plenty of humor that lands even better than anything inserted by Joss Green's reshoots, while also adding dark side and some of her most impressive comic book movie moments, Particularly though, Flash's time travel moment at the end of battle, other than that, the four hour runtime the movie delivers on everything Warner Bros. wanted in 2016. The only problem was, now it's no longer part of the plan and Warner Bros. CEO and Sarnoff came off immediately after Snyder Cut released to say they're not going to continue that story or do any more DC moves with Zack Snyder. Just as the interest in his plan, the one Warner Bros. failed to stand behind to promote back in 016-017 is at an all-time high. Warner Brothers should have stuck to their original plan, or just any plan. Now, shortly after Warner Brothers ordered the first of many alterations to Zack Snyder's Justice League plan and Suicide Squad reshoots, it was already apparent that the course corrections were too extreme. Now, in June 2016, Zack Snyder director cut a uh, Batman v Superman, the three-hour Ultimate Edition was released, clarifying that plot details and a more character development, and almost universal, considered the superior version of the film. Then in May 2017, Warner Brothers released Wonder Woman was released, and Snyder was heavily involved in Wonder Woman's early development, bringing in Alan Heinberg to help him develop the story and having him write a screenplay before Patty Jenkins was hired as the director. Now, Jenkins worked closely with Snyder but made the film her own. Snyder, as a producer along with his wife Deborah Snyder, 
and her producing partner Wes Collar and Jenkins also brought several of Snyder's most frequent collaborators onto the crew. Now, Wonder Woman would go on to become one of the highest rated comic book movies of our time on Rotten Tomatoes and still holds the DC Extended Universe title for top earner in domestic box office. In their desire to emulate the MCU's success with the DC Extended Universe, they ignored the fact that how Marvel actually started the MCU, particularly if they how, how they handled their early stumbles, particularly in Phase 1 and Incredible Hulk's muted critical reception and criticisms of Iron Man 2's overstuffed universe building plot. In fact, several MCU Phase 1 movies fell far short of box office expectations held in the MCU today. Captain America First Avenger, Thor, Incredible Hulk, they're still among the MCU's lowest earners. But Captain America and Thor would go on to see much more lucrative sequels. While Hulk is still caught in character rights limbo, and Kevin Feige may have made some minor adjustments to the account of Wesson's learned during Phase 1, but he didn't throw out his whole plan and call for massive overhauls to their approach. Even after Avengers Age Voltron got negative feedback for confusing dream sequences and future setups, Marvel didn't decide to just abandon plans to bring Thanos and MCU or forget about the whole Infinity Stones. But as Warner Brothers did with many of the Snyder's story threads with the Nightmare Timeline setup, the benefit of sticking to the plan, even if it is in the home run, is that the larger universes are allowed to actually build into larger payoffs. And we finally saw with Zack Snyder's Justice League continually changing focus loses the synergy and fails to build as much audience investment from film to film. The indecision around how to move forward with the DC Extended Universe was worse than if they'd simply confidently moved forward with the imperfect plan anyway. But Marvel had announced their upcoming Phase 2 and 3 lineups leading to Avengers Infinity War to Endgame, announced that simply Infinity War Part 1 and 2, officially confirming the whole thing was leading to Thanos and Infinity Gauntlet. A giant crossover, meanwhile, Zack Snyder had a big plan charting out DC's own massive crossover finale, defending the Earth from Darkseid and the Force of Apocalypse, but the nature of that plan was never made clear at the time, and franchise was considered to be criticized for not following their plan, like MCU did. But all while a fairly detailed outline of the full story had been sketched on whiteboards in Zack Snyder's Warner Brothers offices with Jim Lee and G.F. Johns. The fact that Darkseid was even going to be considered in Justice League wasn't even known until it was revealed by League Storyboard months after their theatrical cut hit theaters. Even if Warner Brothers still found it absolutely necessary to pivot away from Snyder without finishing their plan, they needed to show public commitment to another plan and move forward with that to instill confidence in their brand. Instead, they got mixed messages and tweets and repeated false starts and announcements and shit for films that never got off the ground, and changes in strategy such that now, five years later, DC Extended Universe has done nothing to actually move past the events of Justice League, both in universe and real life. Now, who's to know how things would have played out if Warner Brothers did stick to their guns after Batman vs Superman came out? Maybe some up minor changes still would have been necessary down the road, but they could have avoided this drama and shame and embarrassment of major fan campaigns like hashtag release the Snyder Cut, hashtag release the Error Cut, hashtag restore the Snyderverse, serving as constant reminders of their 2016 mistakes. In fact, Snyder's entire arc would have been completed by now with Snyder likely moving over projects and leaving the future of the f franchise to another maker. But as for the Suicide Squad, its box office haul may not be the worst problem in the world. Provided to that, it does its job to grow subscriptions for HBO Max, but Warner Bros. decision to detonate the original franchise plans after Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice to chase Ben Ron Tomato scores, only got them better reviewed movies that don't sell as many tickets in the original slate or generate demand for sequels and spin-offs expected from the modern franchise films. Now, Darkseid's impending invasion and Batman's post-apocalyptic nightmare timeline will be damned. 
Okay, so there's that whole history. So now I'm going to be doing another article. If I could find something. Now hold on, guys. Um... <sighs> Just gotta find something. Um... Next, another thing that we're going to try to clear up for all you guys and viewers and subscribers of my channel, Daniel Hutchins, is we are going to be clearing some more things up along with Kevin Foggy and Shang-Chi. Okay, so Kevin Foggy says Shang-Chi experiment com comments that they were a misunderstanding. Okay, so this, if you subscribers and people know, I actually did recently do a video explaining why Shang-Chi was going to be a theater release only. But this is just something kind of related to that almost. But it's just the experiment comments were a misunderstanding. Okay, so Kevin Foggy clarifies that the comments made in regards to Shang-Chi being the experiment and says Marvel Studios put the full support behind this film. This was two hours ago. And it was today, so anyway. Kevin Foggy clarifies that the comments on Shang-Chi and Legend Ten Rings being this experiment were a misunderstanding. Now, Shang-Chi and the Legend Ten Rings is a late entry to the MCU that is currently set to open in theaters on September the 3rd of 2021. With a 45-day theatric exclusive window, the film is now less than a month away and the marketing machine for the movie is in full swing, as their tickets just went on sale. Now, during the Disney Investor Day, CEO Bob Chappelle called the theatrical release in Shang-Chi and Legend Ten Rings an interesting experiment in regards to theatrical distribution audiences would turn out in large numbers, even as this dumb-ass, bitch-ass COVID-19 cases rise. Star Sime Liu took to his social media to defend Shang-Chi, noting that this film is not an experiment, but an underdog. You know how, like, in sports, there's, like, the underdog? Well, that's what they're kind of comparing it to. But the comment caused a great deal of controversy. Controversy. Yes, there's so much fucking controversy right now. It's not even fucking funny. But which has been made worse with the early projections for Shang-Chi putting it at the lowest MCU debut since The Incredible Hulk. Now, related... To this article is everything we know about Shang-Chi and Legend Ten Rings. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about something else. So on Monday, August the 16th, Shang-Chi and the Legend Ten Rings had its world premiere in L.A. And that's in California. So, where the stars and creators got to speak to the press and they walked the red carpet. Now, according to Marvel Studio President Kevin Foggy, via the THR... Foggy noted that the comment on this film being the experiment was a misunderstanding. Now, he mentioned how Marvel Studios put their full support behind the film, and everything's up to on the screen. Foggy said in regards to the Lou tweets, and the whole situation regarding this movie as an experiment, he quoted, He is not a shy man. I think in this particular tweet, you can see, I think everyone does. Now, this misunderstanding, it was not the intention, but the proof is that in the movie that we can swing for the fences like we always do. With this amount of creative energy we put in the, in the budget, there's no expense shared and spared to just bring this origin story to the screen. Okay, so Bob Chapek's word choice may not have been intentional, but the use of word experiment in regards to Shang-Chi and Legend Ten Rings was still unfortunate. Alright, so it also is continuing trend on Marvel Studios president having to step in for an issue caused by Disney. Now, Bob Chappelle's decision to release Black Widow on Disney Plus Premier Access caused a very public fallout with Scar Johansson, or for short, Scar jo, is suing Disney for violating her contract. Now, that's familiar because... You subscribers who are on my first channel, you guys probably already might have already seen that I had talked about it. But it was reported that Kevin Foggy was not happy with this decision, 
or how Disney chose to handle this whole situation. So Shang-Chi and Legend Ten Rings was originally set to open in February of 2021, but before the damn COVID-19 pandemic caused the films to be delayed again, first to July and then to September. And in a summer that has been dominated by sequels, it may be something that one of the biggest surprises was this original film, Free Guy. You know Free Guy, Ryan Reynolds, you know, same dude who does Deadpool? Yeah, him. But we're not talking about him. But that could be a good sign for Marvel Studios. Now, like Free Guy, Shang-Chi and the Legend Ten Rings is a 45-day theatric exclusive and also looks to offer audiences something new to look at or check out in the meantime because of this post-pandemic shit. But while it may be part of the larger franchise, it will be a new character and concept in 2008, Marvel Studios threw away everything they had behind Iron Man and film to fight expectations, and it looks like Shang-Chi and Legend 10 Wings could do that again. So, there you go guys, that is all your information you're going to get today from this double article discussion from Screen Rant. I'm probably going to be doing some more Screen Rant probably throughout the week. So, please keep your eyes out for some more videos, and I'll see you in the next ones. Bye.